Um, thank you so much for coming to today's educational rounds. Um, to begin, I would like to acknowledge that Queens is situated on Anishinaabe and all the Shoei territories. Um, I'd like this morning to take a minute and uh, let you sit with that acknowledgement um, and perhaps reflect on how we continue to benefit from the um, colonial project, how we continue to benefit from our own positionality, and what does this mean for those who continue to face um, systemic exclusion. Those who don't know me, my name is Claudiana Tomitro, and I'm with the Office of Professional Development Education Scholarship um, as Director of Education Development. And it's my absolute pleasure to um, facilitate the rounds this year. Um, although they won't be possible with, without our um, wonderful and um, passionate speakers. And it's my absolute delight that this morning we have Dr. Stephen Mann uh, to talk about perceptions. Residents' perceptions of CBME, and um, he'll share with us results of a national survey. Um, Dr. Steve Mann is an assistant professor and orthopedic surgeon here at Queen's with a clinical practice including trauma and hip and knee arthroplasty. He recently completed his master's of medical education through the University of Dundee and is director of the undergraduate medicine uh, musculoskeletal course. He serves as chair of the Orthopedic Surgery Competence Committee. Oh, you do a lot. Um, it sounds like more when you put it all together. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you so much. Laura, it's all yours. Um, sorry, I should have mentioned there are treats and coffee. Um, please feel free to get up and help yourself. Um, and there is also a book draw at the very end, so make sure you stay at the very end. Thanks. Thanks. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me. And uh, I know everybody always says this at the beginning of every talk about how it's meant to be interactive and then stands up here and lectures for 45 minutes. But this, uh, honestly, um, Please, this is informal, right? So if you have any questions or comments or whatever, actually, there are at least three or four people in the room who know more about this project than I do, so. Um, uh, but yes, thank you, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and for those of you who are in the clinical world, that means I'm not particularly bright, so I really appreciate all the help of my co-authors and everybody else involved in this project. Uh, and this is uh, really something, actually, I should disclose before I start that I have nothing to disclose, um, but that the financial support from this project came via the Maudsley Funds, uh, for which I'm sure many of us are grateful for ongoing educational support. Um, I would like to acknowledge, again, uh, especially my co-authors, uh, Nancy and Heather are both here, Vivesh is a medical student. Um, who has just started third year and uh, was involved in this project uh, over the summer. And then Rylan Amber, who's here, uh, Teresa Beasley, who's now at McGill, and Stella, who is my master's project supervisor at the University of Dundee, who were uh, very mu all very much involved in the background work to this project, which I'm going to talk about in a sec. So the topic of CBME obviously needs no introduction to any of you. Um, but this project really grew out of what was my MMED uh, thesis project, and so that involved uh, a local study here uh, which, with some difficulty. We ended up interviewing 16 residents, um, so these were sort of uh, semi-structured interviews, really because we'd identified a gap in the literature and that people have been talking about CBME for quite some time, but nobody had really talked very much to the people who were arguably most affected by it, and that's the trainees. And so my master's thesis project was looking at resident perceptions of CBME at Queen's prior to implementation. So basically, what did residents expect from CBME as it was kind of coming down the pipe? And so that um, involved local interviews. Obviously, here we interviewed 16 residents from medical and surgical training programs uh, between 2015 and 2016. I say we, it was really Amber. Um, and then out of that, uh, as we developed themes and, and sort of built up what residents were thinking about, those themes informed the development of a national survey, which is then the basis for this project that I'm hopefully not going to bore you to death with now. So again, there's a fair bit in the literature about what educators think about CBME. There's some in the literature about what just regular faculty think about CBME and how to get them more engaged and involved. 
and there's at least mention in the literature of how this is going to affect our administrative staff in terms of transitioning from paper to computer and the volume of uh, assessments that have to be tracked and everything else. But surprisingly enough, there was practically nothing in the literature about what trainees think about CBME. Uh, and you can argue about whether that reflects a top-down approach to education despite the lip service that we might pay to you know, actually paying attention to trainees and what they think. Uh, but regardless, there really was next to nothing written about what trainees think about competency-based medical education in, in any shape or form. And so having identified that as a gap, I thought it would be useful to, to maybe find out a little bit more about it. And so residents obviously experience CBME, residents who come into that style of training or are, are transitioned to that style of training. They also serve as assessors in CBME, and this is arguably most important in the early years of the rollout where you have junior trainees, you know, PGY1s and 2s and so forth, who are in a competency-based program who are relying on their senior residents in many instances to be the primary assessors of many of the EPAs and things that they have to have observed because not all of those are done by faculty uh, and for many of them faculty aren't actually in the best position. And so this represents really a formalization of what has been going on for a long time, which is that senior residents teach junior residents, right? We all, we all know that. Um, but for residents who haven't gone through CBME themselves, it then puts them in this new position of acting as assessors or givers of feedback within a CBME paradigm without ever having gone through that themselves. So that is a bit of a change. Uh, and then residents experience the effects of CBME not only in those two senses, but also in the fact that, and, and this certainly came up in the interviews that we did here at Queen's, in the fact that there's the potential for there to be a bit of a divide within programs and that there may be jealousy on either side of the fence uh, about residents who aren't experiencing CBME compared to those who are. Is the, are there different educational strategies? Do the residents in CBME get special treatment? And then, so there are all those potential effects as well, which again, theoretically, we can say, well, you can understand how these might happen, but no one has actually really gone into much detail uh, formally studying mm -hmm. how, how residents feel about this. So again, this is all kind of the, the impetus for the project. And so, Again, based on the themes that we identified during the local study here, we developed an online survey which was sent out to post-grad medical offices across Canada. Uh, and that was, uh, the process started in June of 2019 and was, sorry, 2018, and was ongoing in through the fall. We had initially hoped to get it administered uh, before all the PGY1 started. There was a, uh, understandably a bit of a trickle down effect. And so ultimately, we ended up with responses from 434 residents. It's a little hard to say what that response rate is because it's not entirely clear what the denominator is because not every PGME office got back to us and confirmed that they had or had not sent out the survey and to how many residents. Um, but all that to say, we had nearly 300 residents who uh, responded prior to being enrolled. In, uh, they were, they were pre-CBME, so what we might call traditional training. And then 100 and nearly 140 residents who were currently enrolled in a CBME model of training. So just about a, a two to one ratio there of, of traditional compared to in CBME. Sorry, can you, yeah. uh, can you say the, the first number, the pre-CBME, are uh, residents who were never going to be in CBME? That's right. Okay. So they were senior residents, presumably, or, or ones whose training program you know, wasn't, hadn't been involved in the CBD rollout yet. Yeah. And there were, we had, I don't think we included them, we had just a, a few responses from medical students who were going to be enrolled in a CBME program but hadn't actually started yet. Okay. Um, but there were, there were a few of them, so we just admitted them to keep it a little more homogenous. So, this is a busy slide, but basically what this is showing is it was a mixed method survey, so we had quantitative studies in which uh, or questions uh, in which the respondents were asked to uh, complete a, a five-point Likert score from strongly disagree to strongly agree with the following statements. And so we've got it stratified here into those who are in the pre-CBME or traditional training and then the ones who are currently enrolled in CBME when they answered the questions. And so you can see these are, again, the themes that emerged from previous interviews talking about faculty time constraints and limiting limitations. 
um, the need for frequent assessments. What I've done is highlighted in green here the ones, let's see if, I don't know if there's bias there or not if I've used green instead of red, but the ones who feel that CBME uh, was better, you might say. So residents who are in CBME, and the bottom of the slide got cut off, I apologize. Two asterisks mean it's statistically significant at point zero zero five, and then one asterisk is 0 0.05. And that's non-parametric because they were not normally distributed. And that's all the stats I'm going to say for the whole talk, I promise. <laughs> uh, if you have questions, ask Heather afterwards. So what you can see here is that traditional residents, or ones who would not personally engaged in a CBME style of training, uh, felt strongly, in the mean here of just over four on a five-point scale, that time was going to be a significant limitation for faculty. Right? They, they were concerned about that. And what you can see here is in, for residents who were actually enrolled in CBME, there was a positive change in that they were less concerned about that. Okay. Now, as you all know, there's a difference between statistical significance and clinical significance. I think we can potentially argue about whether the difference of a mean of 4.13 versus 3.9, statistics aside, is meaningfully different. I think that one of the keys from this is actually that basically it's a four on a five-point scale in terms of agreement that faculty time constraints are still limiting in terms of getting feedback quality feedback in CVME, and as we explore the qualitative results, we're going to talk about that, okay? But from a statistical point of view, again, not as bad as what's expected, okay? Similarly, the number of assessments that people have to get filled out, more of a concern for residents who weren't in CVME than those who were actually living through it, suggesting that it's not as bad as we might think. Um, Interestingly, the concern about people being able to make reliable decisions about competence using the model didn't really change much. And definitions of competence, this concern that it uh, might not be uniformly applied, that people are going to struggle to determine who's competent and who isn't based on the criteria, um, not as much of a concern to begin with. Um, Again, actually, that should be in red because it was more of a concern in CBME than it was beforehand. I apologize. My red green color blindness is showing. So that should be red in that it was slightly worse in CBME. Again, you can argue how much of a, a difference that really represents. Further questions we asked here you can see in the CBME model, faculty, again, spending more time on administration of the program than in actually teaching, which was a concern. Again, a much more marked concern for residents who had to get gone through CBME than for those who were actually in it. You can suggest that that's reassuring as far as it goes. Uh, and then the other one I wanted to highlight, I think I have a, I do have a circle. Um, residents in general, in both methods of training, are very satisfied with the training. And I think that fits with what we know, right? And I think if you talk to frontline faculty about this whole change, there's very much a feeling of, it's not broken, why are we fixing it? And I think you can frame the change to CBME in different ways. And I think if we talk about, as we're going to talk about with the qualitative findings, increasing resident responsibility and self-reflection and taking some ownership for learning, and as Jess can speak to far better than I can, the fact that there's room for improvement in the way we coach trainees uh, and the way that we offer feedback. But the bottom line is that I think some people got the message that there was something horribly wrong with how we've been training residents for the last 50 years. And I don't think that's true. And, and I think residents recognize that and say, overall, they're very pleased with the training that they get under both models. And, and I think that is <coughs> worthwhile remembering. So. Steve. Yes. Can I just ask, um, to what extent did you feel that the pre-CBME residents understood CBME well enough to actually answer those questions? It's an excellent question. Um, because we, we didn't collect a great deal of information from them in terms of what program they were in, what year, we, we didn't want anything identifying, and also we wanted to keep the survey short enough to get a reasonable number of responses. Um, so the short answer is I don't know. Um, obviously, what we found with the interviews we did just as Queen, with Queen's residents, as the rollout date got closer, residents were far better informed about CBME and what it meant, uh, which makes sense because there was more and more talk about it as the go live date approached. So I have no idea and I can't tell you whether some of these residents were 
you know, three years away from CBME going or CBD going live in their program or whether it was right around the corner and they were very well informed. So that's absolutely a weakness of this study. You're, you're absolutely right because we don't know what their baseline level of knowledge is. Yeah. Uh, Steve, can you go back a slide? Other back. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, I was trying to figure out what the, sorry, if you go forward to your next slide. I was trying to figure out why the CBME model will encourage resident self-reflection is non-significant when there's other ones that have a bigger spread. I think it's probably because that answer is answered very variedly. Well, so it has to do with the distribution. A lot of, there's a big yeah. distribution on that one. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. very interesting that that question is one with, with a huge distribution. It's, it says a lot about... <clears throat> says a lot about how varied that, that, that response can be and how polarizing it can be. Absolutely, which is, which is funny because if you, if you think about probably what most of us perceive to be one of the, the, the selling points of CBME is absolutely this is about resident self-reflection and ownership. Uh, interestingly, that theme came up a lot in the qualitative data. Interesting. Um, so, so you're right, it is interesting and that's, <coughs> bless you. Um, Again, within the limitations of the data we collected, not something that I can give you a firm answer on. But no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, That's not a limitation. That's a really neat finding. Yeah. yeah. People forget non-significant findings are really interesting too. Absolutely. Absolutely. <coughs> there, was a, there was just an article in an orthopedic journal of all things about p-values, believe it or not. About how we, you know, need to pay less attention to them potentially than we do. There's a really good one in Scientific American where recently, so maybe that's where that one came from, then the fellow who invented the p-value actually said he regretted the day he ever said yeah. p-value was statistically significant because it took off in a way that he never anticipated. Human nature, right? We yeah. look for something simple, we say that's the number I'm looking for yeah. and, and yeah. it's obviously many shades of gray compared to the black and white we like to think in. Really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Right. Any other comments on the, the quantitative stuff? Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. So the qualitative findings, we sort of have arranged and into three themes. And there was an absolute ton of qualitative data, which was really exciting. Like people were obviously excited to tell somebody what they thought about this because we had tons, we, Heather, had tons and tons of stuff to go through. Um, so I'm just presenting some of the highlights here, uh, but it is uh, really good. So it's been organized here into three themes, so the sort of program outcomes, the changes that were anticipated or that had been experienced, and then emotional responses to this whole, whole process. So first theme is uh, concerns or comments, uh, as you like, about program outcomes. And so one of the sub-themes that came up was the notion of administrative burden. And this was both in residents who were in the traditional method of training and those who were enrolled in CBME. And so for illustrative purposes here, you know, I suspect there'll be more busy work. And as someone who's already a member of a smaller <coughs> program, feeling that I already get enough individualized supervision and attention. And so the, the feeling of more work without perhaps meaningful change in the day-to-day -day education that's being received. Uh, and again, this is just a, an illustrative quote. There are lots of these about how much paperwork, how many forms are going to get filled out, how many tick boxes are there going to be. Um, again, challenges with the assessment process, common in both groups of respondents. Uh, more paperwork, but more observed encounters. I thought this one was good. I'm an R1 in a program transitioning to CBD. It's a learning curve for staff in the emerges. They don't like having to actually observe me taking histories and doing physicals. Um, which is actually really true, speaking as a busy ortho. It's, it's a challenge in a clinic to take half an hour, really, what it boils down to, especially for a junior resident, minimum of 20 minutes to actually sit and watch a history and physical be done. Right? And got 35 people to get through in a half-day clinic. That's a significant chunk of time. And it's, uh, there is a lot of balancing of clinical and educational responsibilities. It's always ongoing, and this has the potential to add to that. Uh, quality of feedback came up a lot. Um, and it was very mixed, actually. So I didn't, there, were, there were a whole bunch of different quotes, so I didn't put any of them up. But there were some people who felt very strongly that, that CBD was going to be kind of the, the magic fix for poor feedback. Um, and 
other people who said, well, I get really good feedback now. I don't see how this is going to change. And so probably a lot of variability in what people have previously experienced, right? And so I think for people who are perhaps frustrated with the quality of feedback they're receiving, they're hoping that this is going to be the thing that fixes it. Other people who are quite happy say, well, well, what's the point? So I, I think it really depends the baseline that, that people were coming into. And a lot of people who said, well, why is anything going to change? It's just a different form. Slightly more cynical. And then related to that is the degree of faculty engagement and buy-in. And interestingly enough, this was back that up, really mostly in the traditional method of training. So this was more of an anticipated program outcome issue than something that was commented on by people who were living through CBD. Uh, the concern that it's going to be difficult for residents to approach staff who aren't engaged um, about providing the feedback that's needed. So we can hypothesize about why that's not an issue within CBD, whether it's that faculty all got a lot better at doing this or that Similar to now, there's certain faculty that residents just don't expect to get a whole lot of feedback from, which is another possibility. Um, there were also concerns, and we're going we're gonna to get to this in a later slide, but talking about quality of feedback and engagement and everything, one of the things that came up was uh, from residents who were in CBD was a lack of global feedback, that everything became very granular and they were missing kind of an overall picture. So we're, we're going to get to that, but it did come up under this theme as well. Uh, the second major theme was about changes. Um, and so this sort of formalization of the assessment process came up a lot in both groups, which, which makes sense, right? If, if you think about what CBME is actually doing, short of just creating a whole bunch of more forms, but Beyond the forms, hopefully, is the fact that it is a formalization of much of the informal teaching and feedback and, and assessment that happens, right? And, and getting that recorded in a meaningful way, hopefully a meaningful way. And so, again, this was from a resident who was pre-CBME. He says, I anticipate I would spend more time completing documentation of clinical experiences than you and I think that's a very valid anticipation that you know, we're getting a little bit more into this mindset of if, if it didn't get recorded or assessed or somehow filled out, then from an educational, formal educational perspective, it didn't really happen. And so I think there was an understanding of that. Uh, and then this, again, an interesting and, and valuable theme, and this was primarily from residents who were, which may speak to what you're talking about before, Maybe something that's just not so much on residents' radar thinking about going into CBD, but certainly those who were involved in a competency-based program, very much uh, a lot of discussion on self-reflection and being proactive, self-assessment, and taking more ownership of education. And so uh, participants talked about the need for self-reflection or the opportunity for self-reflection. Uh, they talked about being engaged in more self-directed learning and realizing areas where they were missing EPAs or what have you, and that can be either from a strictly tick the box sort of thing, I need to get more of these filled out, to a, a deeper recognition of this is an area where I need to gain more experience because I don't feel confident in my clinical abilities or knowledge or whatever. Uh, so, but that notion of self-directedness absolutely came up repeatedly. Uh, and then again, the, the idea of being at least somewhat more free to manage learning opportunities. And obviously there's variability here within programs uh, and the constraints of rotation schedules and everything else. Uh, but the notion, certainly that there's more freedom for residents in CBD, probably more understanding on the part of faculty and everything else, that if there's something that you need to get done, that there's an effort to provide opportunities uh, to make that happen. But also responsibility of the resident to identify what those needs are and then take, take related steps. Then the third theme, which is really quite interesting, and I don't think we really expected this one. Um, and maybe we just didn't pull it out of the interviews here, or maybe residents of Queens are relatively laid back. And also the, the preliminary interviews that we did here were all pre-CBD, pre and people talked about anticipating that it was going to be a rough transition and stuff, but there was, there was definitely more emotional language in the qualitative feedback than what we were expecting to find. So people talked about stress and frustration. Um, I'm actually going to refer to my notes here, sorry. So the, uh, the frustration, or sorry, the, the stress, 
Um, really, they had added stress to pursue evaluations and make sure they were making their numbers. That was a big thing that came up, was feeling that, you know, I, I, there's this constant push to, and if any of you were on um, competence committees, you know it's constantly, you need this many eval, you need to get these EPAs checked off so you can advance to the next stage of training. It's, it's very much a constant making sure you're getting the forms filled out and everything. And potentially to the detriment of make sure you're actually learning things, right? That's, that's always the flip side is making sure we're not just getting forms filled out for the sake of having the forms, but making sure people are actually learning things. Um, and residents prior, so a traditional residents not, in, not enrolled in CBD, they felt stressed about the anticipated increase in administrative work. So the, the same thing, but just in an anticipatory sense, a feeling that there's going to be a lot of running around, a lot of chasing of forms, uh, that kind of language that came up and, and feeling not only that that was coming, but that it, it induced this stress response. And then for residents who were actually living through it, there was uh, frustration. And so frustrated for the same reasons that they were anticipating, uh, but also the need, that this came up a few times, the need to have things formally assessed that it was obvious that they knew how to do. Right, and I'm sure you've all run into this too. A resident comes up, you know, like a PGY2, very good resident. It's like, I need this EPA filled out for like documenting a clinical encounter or some very basic skill that it, it's very obvious that he or she is quite capable of doing, but hasn't had the box ch checked yet. And then has to, I had one resident who it had to be done in a certain phase. And so he had to get a note from an out of town rotation had to get the doctor's secretary to find a note and fax it in so that somebody could, it was just this whole rigmarole. And so residents find that stressful, understandably. They're busy, they've got other things to do than chase down getting a box ticked in. So that's, that's one example, um, but there were, there were several like that talking about the frustration of feeling that this is unnecessary administrative work that's not actually necessarily directly contributing to education. And you didn't... Yes. Just, I find that quite interesting because I think what I'm hearing is that the residents' perception is that we're creating this culture of assessment as opposed to this culture of learning. Absolutely. So, anyway, it's just interesting. Yeah, I would say I would second that, and, and I think we're also creating a culture of assessment where the burden is actually on the, the resident to a much larger extent right. than it was in the traditional model, which is a big difference. Absolutely. And you didn't find this at Queen's when you did your smaller study? There was... I think there was, there was definitely the anticipation of more administrative work and more paperwork. Um, we didn't get the same emotional language necessarily. Uh, I, again, nobody had lived through it yet, and, and I think certainly much of it is coming from people who have actually gone through it, and so there's, there's more angst behind the lived experience of having to, yes, chase down these forms and get the boxes ticked and everything, but certainly the, the stress of having more paperwork and more assessments and everything to get done was an anticipated problem even in our this smaller study here. So, so I wonder two things from that. I wonder, first of all, if, if that's one of the advantages of having an institutional approach, is that um, because everybody's in the game, maybe it takes some of the pressure and frustration off. I'm not sure, but maybe. Absolutely. Um, and the second thing I want to comment on is in the recent Program Evaluation Summit, I started hearing about studies coming up about residents themselves actually doing studies on the impact of CBD and their wellness. And so I'm starting to flag that this is a really important issue. Absolutely. So, so I'm Absolutely. Glad came, no, I'm not glad that it came out in your study, but it's important, but really important, important to listen sure. to this. Yeah. I think just to follow up on that, Elaine, um, Steve's study was done prior to CBD implementation at Queen's and the resident interviews that we've done in our study looking at coaching have definitely raised this issue this is about mm -hmm. feeling like it's a culture of assessment and this tension between documentation and actually learning and coaching. Um, so we're definitely hearing that even yeah. at Queen's now. Yeah, I think it's so important yeah. to start paying attention to that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I, I had the fortune of presenting directly, directly before you at ICRE when you were presenting the Queen's oh, right, right. study of this. For it. And I don't remember seeing the strong emotional responses, and I was wondering if it was the institutional approach right. that I was having it go for. Mm -hmm. What were any of the other emotions? Like these, these were the strongest of the it, lot, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't think there wasn't a whole lot of joy necessarily. It was <laughs> <laughs> what I'm getting at 
it is either ambivalence or this. Yeah, uh, and that, I mean, that's, it's the same phenomenon as what you see in Google reviews, right? People who are upset are more likely to vent in an emotional way yes. in general. And so there were the people, people certainly talked about, you know, it's been beneficial in terms of encouraging my self-reflection or whatever, but you don't get the same strong emotional language with that. People are, are less likely to come out and say, I love self-reflection and keeping a portfolio and everything. They're more likely to say, this is a giant pain in the backside when I've still got to look after patients and do everything else I have to do. People don't really pipe up and say, I have no strong opinion about this. Um, you get the positivity or the, you don't really get the math. Yeah. I'm, the motivation guy is going to tell you that their motives behind this question is interesting. I'm thinking that it, it's very interesting what the people's costs are. Like what they say, like what is the price I'm paying for CBME? Yeah. That sort of stuff. That's an interesting way of doing a secondary analysis with your data. Right. Might want to consider that. Yeah, absolutely. She'll help you write it. Sure. <laughs> I, I'd be concerned about oh, burnout actually if, I, yeah. like, yeah. if there was a lot of this because yeah. it might reflect trainees not having as much control over their environment and, and we know that's a pretty big factor. So I, I wouldn't kind of worry about that seeing these responses. Which is a bit paradoxical when you think that one of at least the stated aims of CBD is to increase in many ways training and control, right? Saying we're going we're to let you identify your weaknesses and pursue them, but if that's not what's actually being accomplished, then we're just yes. hedging them into this box of forms. Absolutely. That, 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 loss, of, that, that loss of ownership of spaces <coughs> manifests as a, as a prelude to burnout. You have a chance of predicting it before it happens. By program? Uh, we didn't have that information. No, it was it was strictly either pre pre or oh, or okay. in CB. We we don't have the breakdown How of what. About the interviews. Uh, yes, so we do have that. We do have that for the Queen's interviews. Again, that's a small sample size. Yeah, we had sixteen sure. respondents, and uh, we we did do an analysis with that study, um, comparing surgical to non-surgical, and, and didn't find any difference in the, the themes that arose. So we just see more size because I noticed that with your quantitative data, you have a kind of a not very. Uh, they talked about administrative burden right. uh, as being not a huge concern, but then one of the qualitative comments was they were concerned, and yep. it had to do with the size of the program. And I know that you know this comes up just in an anecdotal way. Absolutely. The size will, will very much uh, change how they perceive the assessment process and how relevant it is for them. For sure. And that, and that probably applies to faculty as well. You know, small faculty, sure. you, there's no way to spread around the forms, yes. right? Everybody's getting them all the time. So in terms of the discussion, sort of framed it in, in three categories, if you like. So the, the advantages, the difficulties, or the challenges, and, and finally the implications, which are sort of more or less the takeaways here. So really, to me, the advantages that came out of what we, what we saw in the data, standardization and formalization. And, and residents recognize that. I think they recognize that there's been a lot of very good, if you look at satisfaction with their training and everything, a lot of very good but very informal feedback where your trainees are getting told what they need to hear, but it may be not necessarily recorded on a form or in the ITER or whatever, but they're, they're hearing it. Uh, but people did anticipate and experience more formalization and standardization and felt that overall that was beneficial. Um, language like you know making sure there's a level playing field or that everybody's on the same page. Um, definitely learner responsibility and self-reflection and, and that cuts both ways as we talked about. Uh, but very much a recognition and an appreciation of the fact that there is more ownership of educational goals at least being provided in terms of identifying weaknesses and at least some freedom to, to pursue those. Again, the flip side, which we'll get to, is the, the assessment burden and, and everything else. And, and then related to that, the ability to focus on identified areas of weakness. And I think that these, if you, if you look at, I'm not on any Royal College committees or anything like that, but I, th it, I think if you look at what the Royal College has put out and probably stated goal, I think this would align pretty well with what the actual goals of CBD were, right? That this was kind of right up there. The, the biggest ones that came out, I, again, we, we talked about this, the time, the time factor. And so residents talked about that from the faculty perspective. Again, concerns that the, this, was, this was a bigger burden on faculty whom they recognized already have a lot on their plates. 
And then for the, for the residents themselves, you know, there's a lot of time spent tracking down faculty, trying to get forms filled out, trying to get things completed, tracking to make sure you've got enough of whatever EPA D7 or whatever the case may be, right? Making sure you, you've got all the boxes ticked. And so that's time that's therefore not spent doing other things. And all of us who are clinicians know, and there's tons of research on clinicians in terms of how much time is spent doing paperwork versus actual patient care. And so you can arguably extrapolate that to trainees and say how much time is spent on this kind of paperwork versus actual learning, so to speak. Because as we all know, getting a form filled out is not the same as actually receiving feedback or a quality educational interaction, right? Uh, this concern about global feedback I thought was really interesting. Um, the residents, uh, again, the respondents, it, it came up uh, repeatedly. You're getting details about whatever the presentation may be, you know, the, the critically ill patient or the specific diagnosis or wherever your program's got the EPAs broken down, but nobody's sitting you down and just saying, here's how you're doing overall. And that's something that was really recognized as something that was lacking, uh, which uh, at least theoretically was a concern with, with CBME from the outset is, are you getting so granular that you're, you're missing the forest for the trees sometimes? Uh, and that's something that's come up anecdotally, I'm sure you can relate as well, on our competence committee, where you've got someone who's overall, you just say, kind of struggling. Like there, there's, there's big issues, but still has all the EPAs getting ticked off because, you know, the specific things can be or are being done well, and you're getting the form filled out. But if you, if you look at that training overall, say, well, we've, we've identified problems, but how do you... Where, where do you say that, right? How does it fit into this paradigm? Uh, the other thing that came up was the, the potential for lack of meaningful and sustained change and that, you know, we've, we've substituted new forms and we're doing all this, but day to day, I don't think much in my training has actually changed. I've got the same rotations, I've progressed through the same way. I'm working with the same faculty who still teach the same way as they have for the last 20 years. So, so how much of a difference is this actually making or is it just kind of a, a rebranding and some window dressing? And is that because because it's still considered an add-on to their practice, something you do at the end of the day rather than really embedded? That we uh, there was most of the language around that was you know the the chasing down forms, which feels very much like the end of the day trying to get something done. Um, there wasn't much about feeling as though their day-to-day -day teaching had changed substantially as a result. I think it's probably a bit of. The good teachers were good teachers before, and they're they're still going to be. And, and the ones who weren't aren't necessarily magically going to change because they've got different forms to fill in. You know, that's a really really important point. I mean, that's why we did the core components framework because we were so concerned that this was going to um, denigrate into uh, an assessment assessment form issue rather than an understanding that CBME is about transforming the whole learning experience. And so that's, so I'd like to highlight how, how important that issue is. And also the decreased global feedback is um, more than anecdotal because you know the article we just published in Academic Medicine around a rapid evaluation in Emerge found exactly that. And the crew were so responsive that right away, as you know, they implemented, they went back to implementing a, a piece of global feedback as well because the residents at the end of the day just really wanted to know, am I going to be a good eMERGE doc? Absolutely. Which is a really, which is a whole different ball game than competence and, and as you know, as, as important perhaps from the resident perspective, even more important. Yeah. So, so yeah, absolutely. important findings. It, this language came up a few times as well, the idea of this actually paradoxically detracting from learning. And so there were a couple of respondents who talked about you know, there may be an interesting patient, but if I need this particular EPA, I'm actually going to choose the patient I go see based on the EPA I need to fill out rather than what's going to be the best educational experience for me, which is tragic when you read something like that, right? Saying it's the whole, and getting back to the idea of the system squeezing you into this box and preventing you from actually doing what's going to be most beneficial or valuable for you. Yeah, but that's another example of where if the system of, if the curric the way of re revising, devising the curriculum around competencies was actually aligned, 
then this should be a non-issue because residents should become confident that they're going to get all of the learning experiences that they really need. Even And in that moment in time, they should actually be able to go to the interested patient because it should align, right? A lot of shoulds. Shoulds. And, and you know, wouldn't that be nice if so? So again, great, great findings because yeah. it's really showing us some, some areas. Because areas. you have that tension between how yeah. it should work and theoretically yeah. totally. ought to work totally. between the resident who knows that for promotion I got to tick these three boxes and I got a chance to get one ticked and yeah. so. Yeah, right. it's, a, it's a tough, terrible decision. Yeah. Uh, and then again, we, we talked about this already, but the, the stress and fatigue, the pre-burnout, if you like, um, associated with the, with the paradoxical lo loss of control in many ways or, or some loss of flexibility and just the sheer effort required to keep on track of your EPAs and get the forms filled out and everything else. So then the implications, uh, I think, and in, in these are just reading, reading out of the data a little bit, uh, I think there's definitely room to retain, uh, as you talked about, global performance, um, not iters as such necessarily, but residents appreciate that high level feedback, right? It's important because it's not just about can you do all these things, it's exactly as you say, it's like, am I going to be a good eMERGE doc, am I where a PGY3 surgical resident should be in terms of my technical skills and everything and and that's I think something that's important not to lose in this process um, and so we've gone back to including just some global performance rating as well as an overall just how are you doing are you where you should be for your level of training because that's that's easy to wrap your head around and, and to work with as a trainee um, acknowledge isn't a very good word I, I don't like it I put it on the slide twice anyway, um, but it, it doesn't really mean anything, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what acknowledgement is from a practical point of view, because uh, it's, it's not exactly an actionable word. Um, but we do need to acknowledge that there's an increased assessment burden and that there are associated emotional responses. And then the mo more important question is what do we do about those? What, what changes can we make to diminish that assessment burden within reasonable limits and to address those emotional responses and to address the resident wellness and so that they don't get burnt out. Residency, I mean, I'm not that far removed. Residency was hard enough at the best of times, let alone adding a layer of burnout provoking administrative work. Um, and so I, I don't have a good answer for that. At the moment, I don't know what the best way is to do that. I don't think the answer is necessarily saying all enter is going to be on an app shortly. That'll make everything better, right? Like, that's great. You can do it on your phone. That doesn't actually change very much, right? And so I think there, there are deeper things that we, we need to do somehow to, to ensure that this doesn't become something that's, that's contributing to a lack of resident well-being. Um, I think having a venue for resident input is really, really important and that get, gets back to the idea of retaining some control over things and, and avoiding those feelings of helplessness which are so strongly tied to burnout. Um, Jess and I are both on the CBME resident subcommittee here which I think is a really useful group. I'm not sure that I'm very useful to it but I think it's a very useful group in general in that the, the resident representatives get to come, they've got a, a direct line to the powers that be so to speak, Damon Dagnoni's uh, on the committee and uh, it's the, what the resident subcommittee brings to the powers that be is, is taken seriously and, and I think that's really important. Um, just for the residents to feel as though they do actually have a voice and that concerns can be brought up there and then addressed and you're not just sort of speaking into the wind or talking to a program director who may or may not be particularly receptive. And so I, I think having a mechanism like that is really, really important. Um, not so much an issue here as we've already transitioned, obviously, um, but having clear communication around the transition so that residents understand what CBME is going to mean uh, I think that's important. And getting back to the emotional responses and the stress as well, right? The, the greatest fear is fear of the unknown. So the more information that can be provided, the less anticipatory stress people are going to have as they prepare to go into a, a competence-based paradigm. And I think as this gets more common, as there are more, more residents and more programs involved in competence-based training, there's going to be less misinformation or uninformation, people just can be more familiar with what it's like and so 
that time, tincture of time is going to be useful for that. But I do think that that clear communication sort of from above is useful in the transition process. And then, again, as has already been talked about, the need for uh, a strategy for ongoing QI, not to say that, all right, check that box, CBME, we're good to go for another 30 years until some of the Royal College decides to do something different. Um, this is absolutely a program in evolution, or at least it should be a program in evolution, right? And so as concerns are expressed by trainees or administrators or faculty or whoever, we need to be receptive to those and have a means for implementing them. Things like global feedback, looking at resident wellness and saying, what do we do in order to try and make this better? I, I think that's crucial. Steve, I think your last point about QI actually addresses some of the concerns about the acknowledging the assessment burden and the emotional responses because the QI can get at what do you actually do about those things. Um, so I think just circling back to your original point about what to do, that's what you do about it. I still don't know exactly what to do besides I, chopping, chopping. I don't think we have all the answers to that yet, but I think that, that the QI process is going to help inform sure. that. Yeah. What I think will be interesting is at Queen's, because we were under the fire proposal, we could make those changes. So I know we've made a lot of changes to our program as we get feedback from our residents or from faculty. But moving forward, as the program becomes a national level, it'll be interesting to see how feedback goes and how often things get changed nationally in order to try to improve that. Which also raises the question of how much flexibility is there going to be for individual programs within the national framework? Like how, much, how much customization can you do to the situation of your own program, which may have four residents or 40, and there are going to be obviously massive differences to how you, how you run a CBD program based on your faculty resident ratio and, and everything else. So Steve, the suggestion might be instead of acknowledge, you might, so first of all, instead of calling these implications, you might want to call them recommendations. Sure. And instead of acknowledge, you might want to say respond to. Yeah. So that, so that there's actually, and this is going to sound a bit like a, I'm splitting hairs, but I mean, you know where I'm coming from. I think rather than a strategy for ongoing QI, it should be program evaluation. Sure. Because QI is really about improving and best practice. Program evaluation is about next practice. Yeah. And so then it allows you to kind of come more to understand that in the transformation, what we're looking for is the best, is, is the next practice, not improving what we currently do, but really innovating. Absolutely. No, that's so a great just, point. You know, I know that may sound a bit like I'm. <clears throat> I'm too fine lining it, no, but no. it is a it's a very different field, as Absolutely. you know. So yeah, just a suggestion. So we conclude these are for what they're worth, three conclusions. So the respondents, the residents did perceive value in the self-reflection identification of weakness, which I which I think is really good. I, I think that's a positive finding that we can draw from this, that trainees recognize that there is an element to C B D that encourages them to be more self-aware, perhaps, uh, than trainees have been in the past, and to take more ownership, and, and that's really useful, and it's, it's beneficial in preparing people to be lifelong learners, which is, you know, part of the whole goal of this. Um, the resident experience is definitely subject to stress and frustration. It always has been. The concern is that this is adding a level to that, and, and again, what we can do to mitigate that and ensure that this is a beneficial educational strategy, not just an addition of a layer of paperwork to training that hasn't actually changed very much. And then a little bit of a trend towards the mean, and I, I think that's something we have to be careful about, that there's the possibility that five years down the road people say, well, we've got fancy new forms, but actually not much has changed. And again, this circles back to that, that need for ongoing program evaluation and receptiveness to feedback all those things that we've talked about to ensure that this doesn't just stagnate and people will, after a couple of years of enthusiasm for this, kind of get used to the forms they have to fill out and everybody will be used to attending a competence committee meeting quarterly, and, but basically nothing changes. And I think that's absolutely something to be avoided. And that is all I have. So. Thanks very much. Some of you.
questions that we have. We have a couple more minutes. I, I'm interested in the, um, the the comment that you made about the resident that was maybe struggling in the program or any program really that that the feedback they had that the, the program evaluation committee had gotten that yeah. was not maybe reflective of that. And it, it, it's pretty, I'm, I'm just surprised by that because the whole idea of CBME to my, to my understanding was that, that the feedback should be improving in quality and that we should actually be getting a better overall picture of the residents. So if that, I don't know if that's a one off or if that happens more than we might think. I think certainly what I can only speak for our program, really, um, the difficulty is. Resident, residents are smart. That's not a difficulty. It's a good thing. But it's human nature. People will trigger assessments for things they've done well. Right? And that's, that's, the whole, that's human nature. And they, want it, they know they need to get these boxes ticked. And so even a resident who's struggling will do certain things to a certain level some of the time. And will then, and so that's a question that's been asked at our competence committee. And we still don't really know the answer to that is, what do you do with a resident who maybe has a bunch of evaluations which are subpar, but has met the criteria for promotion or advancement or whatever because does have three successful ones of this EPA and four of that one and say, well, how do you weigh a, a body of work versus still having achieved what's necessary? I, I don't know if we really know the answer to that yet. Um, Certainly from a Royal College perspective, I don't think there's been any formal guidance on, I mean, you can fail a resident who's not achieving the requisite EPAs. That's, that's pretty black and white, right? But what do you do with somebody who needs four to pass and has four, even though there are 10 subpar? Like where did, how, how does that work? And that's, again, where some of the global stuff comes in, I think, and is important. But I, I think... I think we're starting to see that the more that we study this, we vastly underestimated how bad the feedback we were providing before was, right? So it, if, if the feedback we were providing before was that bad, we just weren't aware of how bad it was, it wasn't that much of a concern. Now that we're studying it, it seems like a lot more of a concern, even though the feedback could very well be improving. Our awareness yeah. of how important it is means that it's not improving enough. It's like our expectations are outrunning our capacity to improve. So it feels like the feedback isn't better, even if it could be, maybe. Yeah. We just know how important it might be. Um, we talked a little bit about the global assessment as being a piece that's missing, but um, I know that milestones are mm -hmm. also something that can be a little bit difficult to sort of wrap your head around in terms Absolutely. of the data that it gives you and the assessment. So EPAs are kind of easier to understand. Yeah. Uh, but then milestones, I mean, I also I think maybe we need to focus our lens in as much as not to lose the bigger picture, but also to figure out if some, for example, what you just gave, the four, four achieved and 10 not achieved, well, maybe the answer is in the milestones. There yeah. might be particular milestones that are never met, or, there are, or it shows that they did improve, and it took them 10 times, and that's part of that model. That's part of the CBD model, is that they're supposed to be allowed to have that time. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, just saying yeah, that there, sure. the data, learning how to use the data, I think, is a big piece of this, that either the competence committee needing to use it, but also the residents, if they're learning to reflect on their own learning, they also need to be able to do that, and maybe that makes them a good judge of their global. The struggle, as it's always been, is the residents who lack insight, right? Sure, yeah. It be, because then you, yeah. Well, if they're caught up, too, in the, in the form filling, et cetera, yeah. and, and not looking at the, but I think it's an issue we're also looking at as well. Sure. I wonder if the, with the resident, I've been thinking about what you said about the resident who's passed everything on paper and yet you know that there's this lurking thing underneath that. Um, we always talk about the need for feed forward, right? And that competency-based education is about patterns over time. So the pattern isn't just going to stick in that one um, what we call them now, you know, this, oh, the stages of training. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it won't just stick. So the capacity to bring that pattern forward into the next stage, so that if the same thing happens, you've got a more accumulated, a bigger picture. And if it happens again, you've got an even bigger picture to the point where it's such a strong pattern that you actually have evidence to be able to say, sorry, you can't actually move forward until this particular area is addressed. Yeah. Is that capacity there? I guess I'm wondering. That's a good question. From a 
from a formal like university senate, I don't know. Like if you wanted to hold a resident back, I don't know what would happen if he but from your, that. But from an educational perspective, yeah. I, I, I think absolutely. Like as the chair of a competence committee, could you say like to your group, listen, yes, we have to pass this person because uh, logically and everything passed, but now as a group, let's continue to monitor and track while this resident goes to the next stage and the next stage and the next yeah. stage. So that would be one way of Absolutely. making sure that doesn't get lost in the shop. And again, that's another benefit of having a small program, right? There yes. are, our, our Commons Committee is six people. We only got 13 faculty, yeah. period. So it's, there, there are not many places to hide. We're all working with that resident fairly regularly anyway, which is certainly helpful. But, but absolutely, and especially for bigger programs, I think having that capacity to sort of the, the institutional memory of the committee, right? To, yeah. 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 You can see that pattern. Yeah. Cool. Thank Thanks you very so much. very much. Um, as you saw us in a couple of times for, come on, that makes sense. Like, it resonated yeah. with a lot of the people here, and there are other things that maybe took us by surprise that we didn't think about. So thank you so much. Okay. We really appreciate it.